Let's take a moment of silent prayer to prepare ourselves for the sacrifice of this. I pray the prayer of the Holy Spirit. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle them with fire of your blood. Send forth your Spirit, and we shall be created, and you shall be the face of the earth. O God, by the light of the Holy Spirit, and instruct the hearts of the faithful. Granted by the same Holy Spirit, we may be truly wise, and ever enjoy those consolations. Through Christ our Lord, amen. Say his mass for the repose of the soul of John and us. Give me justice, O God, and plead my cause against a nation that is faithless. Open name is number 646, Be Thou My Vision, number 646.
God forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Jeremiah. The days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their fathers the day I took them by the hand and led them forth from the land of Egypt. For they broke my covenant, and I had to show them, show myself, the, their master, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will place my law within them and write it upon their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. No longer will they have need to teach their friends and relatives how to know the Lord. All, from least to greatest, shall know me, says the Lord. For I will forgive their evil doing and remember their sin no more. The word of the Lord. The word 
of the Lord.
We hear that God created a new plan. A new plan for the days of the Messiah. The prophet Jeremiah, he prophesied, The days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, the house of Judah. For they broke my covenant. But this is the covenant that I will make. I will place my law within them, and I will write it upon their hearts. I'll write it upon their hearts. Prophet Jeremiah says that God is going to make a new covenant, and instead of writing the law on tablets of stone, right, when did he do that? Ten Commandments, not the Sinai. He's going to write his laws in their very hearts. And that's what's going to make the new covenant different. I was thinking about this, and I was reminded of you know, a story uh, from the 800s in a town in Italy called Lanciano. How many of you have ever heard of Lanciano? Okay, none of you. All right, so this is news probably. About 800 years after Jesus was crucified, there was a Catholic monk, and he was celebrating Mass in the 800s in a town called Lanciano. It's in Italy. And this monk was celebrating Mass, and, you know, sometimes priests can get a little bit distracted when they're celebrating Mass. You know, we do it every day. And so he was getting a little bit distracted, and he was also... He was having some doubts about his faith, and especially about the Eucharist. And when he was celebrating the Mass, and he said the words of consecration, the unleavened bread that he was holding, all of a sudden it started changing form. And it actually morphed into human flesh, blood. And the chalice that he held, again, it changed from wine into real physical flesh, or physical blood. And as you might imagine, he was pretty shocked by this. This is the, the first of the Eucharistic miracles. Uh, some of you may have heard of Eucharistic miracles. Right? This actually uh, is not that uncommon that sometimes miracles happen at Mass. Right? Every Mass is a miracle, but most of the time it's hidden. We can't see it. Like the, the most recent miracle was actually in Connecticut, I think it was last summer, where they were running out of hosts for communion, and miraculously the Saborium never ran out. And it was considered a Eucharistic miracle. It's not that uncommon that these things happen, but this, this miracle in Lanciano was the first time it ever happened. And it just so happens that even though this happened 1,200 years ago, the Eucharist is still there in Lanciano. You can still go and see it. They keep it in these, you know, these glass containers. You can still see the flesh and the blood, which in itself is, is a miracle. Because as you know, if, somebody's, if somebody has flesh or blood that they lose, it decays very quickly. Once it's disconnected from the body. That's why blood clots, for example, when we get cuts and things like that. And so it's preserved all these centuries. And for many years, a lot of you know, skeptics of the church, skeptics of Christianity, they, they kind of thought, you know, well, maybe, you know, maybe somebody's tampered with this stuff. And so the Vatican actually commissioned an investigation in 1970, and they commissioned the head physician of the hospital in Arezzo, Italy. And they also uh, commissioned a chemistry and anatomy professor at the University of Siena. And they did two independent investigations of these findings. And you know what they found? They found, first of all, that there was no preservatives in these materials that they discovered. So clearly, nobody had you know, added something to it to give it the appearance that it still lasted. They also found that the flesh and blood that they examined it appeared to have been taken from a body immediately. Like even just within a matter of minutes, right, flesh and blood starts to decay. And as they examined this flesh and blood, that it had no signs at all of any sort of decay. So it was basically living flesh and blood. They also found that the, the flesh that they found, it didn't just come from you know, any, any old part of the human body. It actually came from the inside of somebody's heart, from the myocardic and endocratic valve, or something like that. I'm not a doctor, but that's what the, all the articles describe it as. I'm having a hard time remembering the specific names. But basically, it, it came from a portion of the heart, which you, you would have had to be like a very experienced heart surgeon to be able to remove this, remove this part of the flesh. Basically, the point is, is that if somebody was trying to make this miracle up, 
There's no way they could have gotten this portion of flesh from the inside of somebody's heart. Especially in the, in the 800s, right? all those centuries ago. Is anybody else's mind blown by this? Isn't this amazing? Like, holy cow, that is crazy, right? It's Eucharistic miracles. Now, the reason why I thought of, it, I thought of this this morning is I was thinking about this reading from the prophet Jeremiah, and I was, I was struck by the fact that this Eucharistic miracle wasn't just from any old portion of Jesus' body, right? It was from his heart. His heart. You know, Laziano, there's actually a, you know, there's a tradition about that city that uh, a very famous person moved there in the first century AD. It was the centurion who was there to witness the crucifixion. The centurion who actually stabbed the side of Jesus and blood and water came out. Anybody know what that person's name was? It's actually a saint. He's Saint Longinus. Saint Longinus. After witnessing the crucifixion and the earthquakes and the darkness and all that, he proclaimed, he said, surely this was the Son of God. And he converted him. And even though his life details are not described in the Bible, there's other ancient sources that describe it. And he actually ended his life in Lanciano. So it's very fitting that the man who actually stabbed the heart of Jesus, that the Eucharistic miracle from his town would be from Jesus' heart. Jesus' heart is of, of immense importance. The, the church fathers, they all recognize that when Christ was dying on the cross and, and he was stabbed in his heart and blood and water poured out, that was like the birth of the church. That all the graces from the church, they actually stem from the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. The blood and water represented the sacraments of baptism and the blood of the Eucharist. Everything that we have in the church, every grace that we receive from Jesus, it comes from his heart, which was poured out on the cross. And I was thinking about that this morning when I was thinking about this reading from Jeremiah. In those days I will make a new covenant, and I will place my law within their hearts. In the New Covenant, God is not just going to ask for a relationship from us. He's not just going to ask for obedience from us. He is going to give us His very own Spirit. He's going to write it on our hearts. I'd like to ask, uh, Carson, can you grab that picture that's standing next to you? This is, a, this is an image of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And we, uh, we have this displayed in our parish office, typically, and it's that's one of my favorite pieces of art. Make sure everybody can see it, Carson. If you want to, you can cover up your face. <laughs> Just make sure everybody sees the Sacred Heart. Right? Now, I love this. In, in our faith, people have often had devotion to the Sacred Heart. Praying for God's mercy, right? And praying that God's compassion be poured out upon us through the heart of Jesus. But one of the things I particularly love about this image is notice that typically when you see an image of the Sacred Heart, the heart is within Jesus' chest. But in this image, Jesus is actually extending his heart out to us. He's extending it out to us. And why is he doing that? It's because he wants to give us his very own heart. And the prophet Jeremiah, when he says God is going to write his law within our hearts, that's what it's supposed to symbolize, that God is giving us his very own heart to love the world. To love God. Why is it that Jesus was able to take the weight of the world upon his shoulders, carry the cross to Calvary? It was because of the power of his heart. Why is it that so many of the saints, why is it that they were able to do such amazing acts of compassion and mercy and even of suffering and being martyrs? It's because their hearts had become Jesus' heart. And it gave this immense strength. There, there's some saints that their hearts were conformed so much to the heart of Jesus that they've actually become incorruptible. That their hearts have not decayed. Like they died centuries ago. And their hearts are literally on display in churches because they've never decayed. It's called an incorrupt heart. And this is the kind of heart that Jesus wants to give all of us. I'm sure that all of you can, can probably think of examples of people in your life who have gone through 
you know, immense sacrifice or suffering or loss. And you're amazed at the kind of strength they carry themselves with. It's because of the strength of their faith. They've given their hearts to Christ, and Christ has given his heart back to them. The point of our faith is not just, you know, following God in obedience and following his commandments. It's, it's literally becoming like Jesus. He gives us his very own heart. Every time when we come forward for communion, that should be our prayer. Christ, give me your very heart. A heart that is poured out for the world. A heart that can take the whole weight of the world upon itself. A heart which gives mercy and hope. Give me your very own Now let us stand and profess our faith. I believe in one God, the Father of all nations.
Pray, brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours be acceptable to God and the Almighty Father. Amen. Hear us, Almighty God, and having instilled in your servants the teachings of the Christian faith, graciously purify them by the working of this sacrifice. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Amen. Lift up your hearts. Amen. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is, right. it is truly right and just our duty and our salvation always set it where to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty, eternal God, through Christ our Lord. For as true man, he wept for Lazarus, his friend. And as eternal God raised him from the tomb, just as taking pity on the human race, he leads us by sacred mysteries to new life. Through him the host of angels adores your majesty and rejoices in your presence forever. May our voices be prayed joined with theirs in one chorus of exalted praise as we acclaim. Do this in memory of me. Graciously grant peace in our days, 
And by the help of your mercy, may you be always free from sin and safe from all distress. As we wait the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, you said your apostles, peace, I'll leave my peace on you. It's not on our sins, but on the faith of your church. And graciously grant your peace and unity in accordance with your will. Live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all. Let's offer each other a sign of peace. Unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Our communion psalms are number 637, In Christ Alone, and from the worship now book number 75, Here's My Heart.
let us pray. We pray, Almighty God, that we may always be counted among the members of Christ, in whose body and blood we have communion, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Let's we'll proceed for some announcements. First of all, we have a trivia question. We go to the trivia. The trivia question today is What was the name of Abraham's wife and the mother of Isaac? The name of Isaac's mom, Abraham's wife. Thanks, that. Who is that over there raising the hand? All right, yep. You know the answer? Rebecca is incorrect. Sorry. <laughs> Anybody else have any guess of Jupiter? Sarah. Sarah is correct. <laughs> also would have accepted Sarai. Yes, Sarai or Sarah. Okay. All right, very good. So, announcements for this week. Reminder that our next Theology and RCA class is this Tuesday. Uh, those classes are all live streamed and recorded, so if you haven't been able to come but you want to learn, uh, you can find them on our YouTube channel uh, at St. Bernard Crawfordsville. Uh, we're also going to have a fish fry this upcoming Friday. Uh, this will be the last fish fry of Lent. So make sure you make it to the fish fry this Friday. Uh, lastly, uh, speaking of the last fish fry, we're coming to the end of Lent, which means we are approaching uh, the Holy Triduum, right? The highest holy days of the year. Holy Thursday, Good Friday, and the Easter Vigil, and Easter Sunday, right? So, uh, these are the biggest liturgies of the whole year. So, first of all, I'd love to have as many people as possible attending these liturgies. But also, if you're interested in, in assisting with any part of it, uh, we're always looking for more members of the choir during the Triduum. You know, we have our normal Sunday morning choir, but not all of them can make it uh, to the services. So, if you're somebody who, you know, has a decent voice, right, and you want to be a part of the choir, uh, that would help us out a lot. And we're going to have a couple of special practices to prepare for the Triduum. Also, uh, we're going to have the Knights of the Holy Temple serving as altar servers during the Triduum. But we also try to get girls from the parish uh, to be a part of the different processions uh, that we do during the Triduum and carry candles. So uh, if you or your daughter right, wants to be a part of that, you can also sign up for that uh, in the narthex, the volunteer table. If you want to be a part of the choir for any of those days, or if you want to be a part of the liturgy as a girl carrying one of the candles, uh, you can register for that out of the narthex, the volunteer table. And I think those are all the main announcements for today, so please stand for the final lesson. The Lord be with you. By your heads for the blessing. Bless, O Lord, your people who long for the gift of your mercy, and grant that what in your prompting they desire they may receive by your generous gift through Christ our Lord. Amen. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Through the prayer of St. Bernard, Holy Father, through the intercession of St. Bernard, we pray that you send out your Holy Spirit upon each one of us, that we may draw all souls in our country closer to your Son, Jesus Christ, and to his church. As we go forth, let's sing number 746, the church is one foundation, number 746. <laughs>